Well, welcome back, everyone. It's been quite a while since I've made a video, but I felt it was time to put up a new one. I have still been messing around with Roar. I've been playing a ton of it. Um, it's one of my most played games right now. And I've done some unboxings, I've done some uh, spoiler reveals or stuff like that. But I haven't actually showed off, like, a constructed deck yet. I've showed off some gameplay with the starter decks, but... Nothing deck profile-wise, which is really what this channel is like normally about. So I uh, felt it was due time to, to put one out. And this is a deck that I've been playing lately that I'm really enjoying. I feel like it's really strong. And I uh, just want to go over it with you, show you a little bit of what this new game looks like in a constructed setting, uh, outside of just opening up a sealed starter deck or something. So. Uh, this uses cards from the starter decks, from the alpha packs, as well as the newest released Escalation packs, um, which is like the booster box series one or whatever, so it's kind of the full collection. The god we're going to be playing in this deck, every deck runs one, is Lyle, the Lord of Lies. Uh, he has the standard 20 war health that every god has. He's a corruption type god, along with Shadow. Those will only really be relevant for certain card effects, but um, every god kind of has these intrinsic traits about them. But he has an effect on him once per game. You can draw five cards, rearrange them in any order, then place them on the uh, back on top of your future deck, which is your main deck. Um, future is your main deck, past is your discard pile, etc. He also has spell resistant three, um, which means if someone tries to use a spell card against him, uh, he gets to roll a dice. If he rolls a 1, 2, or 3, the spell does nothing. So he's basically got a 50% chance of getting out of every spell. Um, most gods have a, at least a 3, some have a 4. His 3 because he's um, pretty good otherwise. To go with a god, you always have a shrine. So they're always kind of paired together like this. Uh, this shrine here, the Cave of Secrets, the Hidden Deep, is the sort of specific shrine to Lyle. Um, it has an effect on it. Each time, an, uh, each time an enemy player draws a card, you can force them to reveal one card from their hand. If controlled by Lyle, which it is, uh, you may force them to reveal one random card instead. So basically every time they draw a card, you get to just pick one card out of their hand and see what it is. They don't discard it or anything, but you just get some some hand knowledge. You don't get They don't get to just keep showing you the same useless card or whatever, you always get to pick something different. And these here, um, you have one power dice each turn, that's how you generate mana. Once you roll six points or whatever, you can buy a second one for six, a third one for twelve. They all have that. And then you have a reserve where you can keep any unspent power up to six. So this is how your kind of starting setup is, this is what you build your deck around. And then you also have um, at least three battlegrounds. Now normally these would be in the same sleeves as your main deck. Um, when the game starts you'd set down your god and your shrine, and you then, based on what your opponent sets down, can go into your deck and pull out any number of uh, battlegrounds up to three that you'd like. So there's some merit to running more. Uh, however, at this point in the game, um, obviously there's more to come or whatever, but at this point I haven't yet found a reason to have more than the three that I need to have. So uh, I typically tend to just leave them in their own sleeves because nothing shuffles them back into your deck or anything like that either. So there's no real reason to have them as a part of the main count or in the same sleeves. It's easier to just pull them out this way. The first one that we use is called Eastern Rise. Uh, all defending units here get plus one to their accuracy when intercepting in this battleground. Uh, creature cards have a attack value and accuracy and a defense or a health um, so this, I have to roll one or a two to hit with this guy. He's not very accurate because he's a small guy. But uh, this gives me plus one accuracy when defending, so it makes his two a three. So just makes it easier for me to defend if my opponent attacks here. If they get through and deal damage to my god, they get to draw a card. Um, Death Dealer means if, if one player, if either player kills something in battle, they get that bonus. And body count is whatever player gets the most kills in that battle gets... Uh, that reward. That's kind of the standard breakdown, draw, reroll, reroll, but some of them vary a little bit. We also have Southland Hills. Only a powerful army may dare threaten Bashan. This battleground requires the assaulting army to have at least four units participating in order to be eligible to receive the body count reward. 
that's a lot of words for basically says if they want body count, which is two reroll dice, which is pretty good, they have to fight here with at least four uh, units. Doesn't happen very often, um, and it just dissuades them from, from trying. And then the Rotterham Ranch. Now this is a card that currently I feel like every deck should run. Uh, your units cost one less power to deploy when you control this card. Uh, that's right. Every every creature costs one less. Um, that seems uh, fantastic, right? You'd be right. It is. But uh, the the battleground rewards here: line breakers, draw a card, death dealer, the reroll die. But then there's also one called rigors of war, which gives an experience point to one uh, one unit that you control that didn't die in the battle gets an experience point, which means they can increase one of their three dice by one. Which is awesome. You can make a unit do more damage, have more life, be more accurate, etc. The one downside to Rotterham Ranch is that if your opponent gets through here and actually deal, deals damage to you, uh, you lose this card. It's flipped upside down. It's destroyed. Now, in the rules, uh, if all three of your battlegrounds are destroyed, um, you lose the game. Or not even all three. If all of your battlegrounds, so even if you had like five or six or seven, if all of them are destroyed, you uh, you lose the game. Currently, there's nothing that does that. Um, this is the only card that gets destroyed. Um, there's no card that currently destroys Battlegrounds, so right now this card is great, and again, like I said, no real reason to run more than the three. However, if we do start getting cards that can like destroy Battlegrounds, running more of them to fill your slots back in is good, uh, and this becomes a riskier play. But for now, this card is just staple. It's the highest rarity, it's a legendary. Um, as it should be, it's just a fantastic card. So getting into the next part of the deck, we will look at our units first. Um, these are just your standard kind of creatures. We've got two copies of a card called Deathless Devotee. Uh, it's, it has this power called Devout. This unit allows you to add plus one to your power roll each turn to a maximum of six. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, when you first roll your when you start your turn, you draw your card for turn, and then you roll your power die. Um, one or two or three, however many you have. And that's how much mana you get for the turn. So you roll a dice. Oh, I got one. I have one mana this turn. Well, this guy lets me increase it by one. So then I can have two. So this is a pretty staple card. Um, a lot of decks will run three of this. We have a little bit more of a control focus deck. So we run two. Um, but I'll get into more of that in a minute why. So we have two. Um, if it comes out, we it costs two to play. Um, the numbers on these cards are in Roman numerals. It's not an 11, it's just a two drop. But uh, two attack, two accuracy, one life. Also pretty good. Never really going to be using this guy to fight, although you can. And in this deck, more than most, you do kind of get to. But um, most of the time, it just sits on the table and gives you plus one power while it's alive. We do have, then, in our case, three copies of a card called Cultist. Now, Cultist is kind of the inverse. It's two cost, two, two, one. But instead of attacking with this card, this card can force a player to lose one power. So as I mentioned before, you have this Reservoir. So at the end of your turn, any mana you didn't, any power, we'll call it, but mana's a easy word, but any power you didn't spend is sort of stored here, up to six. Um, which helps for going into next turn, because then I could have, like, four extra power that turn. Well, this card, instead of attacking with it, I can de de decrease um, my opponent's power by one. So while we have two copies of the one that gives us one additional power, what we're really wanting to do is make things much more difficult for our opponent. So we're going to go with three copies of the one that takes power from them. Instead of gaining power for ourselves, we're okay with going at our own pace, but slowing them down, even better. Then we've got three copies of a unit called the Restless Geist. Now, this has three attack, four accuracy, and one health. It's a five cost unit. Um, one sounds really low, um, as you've seen on a lot of these units, but that's kind of consistent for a lot of these like smaller drop guys. Units definitely like come and go very quickly in this game. Um, this card's just a vanilla, it's got some flavor text, doesn't really do anything, um, but it is just a decent attacker. Three attack for five isn't bad. And four accuracy is, is pretty good. We are obviously trying to control our opponent or whatever, but we do need to be able to do some damage to actually win the game. If you, I mean, 
control is good and all, but I've still got to do 24 damage somewhere, right? So we need some way to, to, to pull that off. And this card helps with that too, uh, Sewer Croc. Now he's a six cost, you'll see five, four, three. Um, these stats sound really, really good for six when this guy was a five and is, you know, just uh, less good. The difference with this guy is he is an aquatic unit. Um, what aquatic means is actually this effect here. Sewer Crocs can only intercept, which means block. Um, if their controller pays one power during combat, they can attack. So normally this guy can't attack unless I pay one power. That's not great, and most of the time, unless you're running like a very dedicated aquatic deck, I don't think aquatic creatures are all that worth it. However, in this deck, when we do start working on getting our kind of control engine going, which we'll get into in just a second, um, this really... The, you, you, what's the right word for it? You get to a point where you need less... You need to control less things. Um, so in that happens, you end up with more power left over to spend, uh, so it doesn't hurt to have to have to spend one power a turn to, to attack with this guy. He attacks for five, if you can get him an experience and get up to six, which, like I said, Rotterham Ranches, most players go to uh, Battleground, so there's probably a likelihood that will happen, or you block at yours because your opponent will want to take it out. Get him to six means that all he has to do is just hit a god four times and that's game. That's really, really good. I'm perfectly fine with paying four power to try that. Then we've got, like I said, getting into this actual control portion of things. So the Truth Seekers of Lyle. Now these are specifically Lyle units. They are part of his little cohort here. They're seven cost, one, five, two. Again, not great attackers, but the point when they're played, you get to look at your opponent's hand, discard a card. Hand control, always good. Especially in a game where we have uh, been able to look all game long at every card that they try to put into their hand, or theoretically most of the cards they've gotten to put in their hand. Um, our hand knowledge um, goes a long way when working with hand destruction. Keeping that theme, we've got two copies of Curious Vampire. A 9 cost, 4 attack, 4 accuracy, 3 life. Uh, it Every time it isn't blocked, every time it attacks and isn't intercepted, uh, the opponent discards a card from their hand. <coughs> so, Vampire doesn't mean anything. Regenerate, cool effect, at the end of each turn. Um, regenerate means this character gains, or recovers one health. So if they've been damaged, they get one life back. Vulnerable to light means they take double damage from light attacks, or light uh, spells and things like that. But that's okay, because most of the light spells would kill it anyway, so we don't care too much that it's uh, vulnerable to it. We also have one copy of the Void Whisperer when this card is first played. Enemy players must draw a card, and then discard two cards at random. So, when this is played, they draw a card. You then get a look at their hand, or well, a card in their hand. Hopefully by this point, you'll be looking at the card they just drew. Uh, and then they discard two cards. If they only had one card in hand, they're now out of cards in hand. Maybe they went and had a card in hand and uh, went to two, now they're at zero. Uh, there's a lot of times where that just happens. Any time that we can kind of whittle them down to, to next to nothing feels really good. We also have one copy of Matthias. Now he's a unique unit, so you can actually only have one of him. I happen to just only have one of this card, or I might run another one, but you can only run one copy of Uniques. So we've got Matthias the Meandering Sage. He's a 9 cost unit with a 4-4-2, four, four, uh, similar stat line to the Curious Vampire. However, where he loses a life, he gains some, some benefits. So when he's first played, enemy player discards a card. That's good, that's what we want. And he has spell resistance too, which means he's got a 33% chance of spells just doing nothing to him. So removal and things like that, he's 33% likely to just ignore. Very strong. We've got one copy of Nephro, the Defiant, a 10 cost unit, 443, also has regenerate. He has spell resistance 1, which is, what is that, a 12 and a half or 18 something percent? Uh, either way, he's just got, basically, if you roll a 1, he doesn't get hit by a spell. Doesn't happen very often, but every so often he gets out of a uh, getting removed because of that. But each time he attacks and isn't blocked, opponent discards a card. 
just like the card that we uh, looked at earlier, you can sense kind of a theme going with the units in this deck. And then most gods in this game have something called an avatar. Um, the avatars are specific to their god. You can't pl you can play any god's avatar in your deck that you'd like, but if your opponent's god uh, matches that name, you can't play it. So if uh, if I'm playing as Lyle and you try to play the mask, the avatar of Lyle, you can't. Basically, this guy is too um, loyal to my god to to come in against him. So you run a little bit of a risk of running one that doesn't belong to you, but most of the time what happens is you run the one that does belong to you. In this case, he's a 15 cost 656. Six. When entering the battlefield, the maps may cause an enemy player to discard a card, and then you draw a card. Awesome. So hand destruction has been good all along, whatever, but now we actually get a draw card too. That's pretty good. A uh, huge attacker as well. Another nice thing with avatars, there are also cards called Manifestations and Relics. Um, these three card types get shuffled back into your deck if they're discarded from play or from hand, um, what have you, uh, based on if they match your god. So in this case, Avatar of Lyle, uh, if it dies, instead of going to the discard pile, I'm going to shuffle it back into my deck, and it can come back to wreak havoc again another day. We've got one card here, it's a card type called a quest. Um, think of these a little bit like um, artifacts or even like enchantments in magic. They just sort of like hit the table and they stay there until something tells them to go away. In the case of veterans of the Hundred Year War here, um, after each combat, friendly units that participated and survived the battle can have one of their stats increased by one to a maximum of six. So in a roundabout way, this card just says at the end of each fight, Every guy that you have that didn't die gets one experience. Now, uh, we were talking about that card earlier, the Croc, having five attack. If this fight's in a battle, uh, attacks or defends, uh, and doesn't die, it just automatically gets a point. Uh, we can go to six, we can go to five, we can go to four, whatever we'd like to do. Most of the time we go to six. This card is extremely, extremely, extremely strong. And currently there's nothing that removes a quest from play. So a lot of decks that I've seen, I say that like there's like this huge meta, but of the few of us playing, uh, we're all pretty much in agreement that this card is at least a one of in every deck. In aggressive decks that want to be in battle more often, this is like a two of probably. But um, I always run one copy of this. If you draw it, it sticks to the table for two mana, uh, two power. It It's so easy to play. It's so powerful, it lasts all game long. Just a really, really strong card. And then we run three copies of Bountiful Harvest. Now this is a tactic. Um, tactics are a little bit like sorceries. Um, however, they can be played on either player's turn. Um, they don't, however, like interrupt. They don't create a stack like in Magic, so it's not quite an instant. Um, but any time that your opponent is kind of between doing things, uh, you could play one of these. This card costs three, and draw the top five cards of your deck, select the unit in it, put it in your hand, shuffle the rest back into your deck. So, um, really, all this does, top, look at the top five of your deck for a creature, a unit, put it in your hand. That's pretty good. Um, anytime we can do a little bit of digging, um, mini tutoring is always, always cool. There's an, also a really fun little combo that you can do if you really, really need to draw something where you can use Lyle's effect to look at the top five of your deck, put them in any order, and then use this card um, when you know that it's safe to do that. Now you can only burn Lyle's effect once per game, so it's often not as, as, not as advantageous to use this effect right before using this. However, if you're like really desperate for mana and trying to come back from something, doing that first and knowing that you're gonna hit something and then playing this to hit the card that you now know is up there, um, is pretty cool. There have been plenty of times where a card like this is whiffed, you've burnt three power for nothing, and that sucks. Now we get into the last card type in this deck, um, spells. We have three copies of Disruption. Um, this is basically just like counter spell. Um, target spell doesn't take effect and is discarded. It must be cast immediately after and before any other actions. So there's nothing you can do kind of between uh, this and the thing that you're trying to counter, but your opponent plays a card or a spell, uh, disrupts it, puts it in the discard pot, costs two, 
incredible effect. Um, every deck kind of runs these. Um, it is a, called a retort and an incantation. Incantations are basically like single turn or single use spells. And then retorts are the ones that are like specifically instants. So they do create a stack and uh, are a little bit faster than the non-retort cards. But just a powerful, powerful card. Um, any game that has a counter spell runs it, right? Or at least especially any control deck within a game. And we've got three copies of Blinding Light. Another retort, which we can use to answer, um, an action done. Two cost spell. Target unit takes one light damage and has its accuracy reduced by three to a minimum of one. Now this is an incantation, so it's only good until the end of the battle that we're in. But uh, that sometimes is the difference between getting hit by an attack and not. Um, sometimes you can use the one damage to just kill a little blocker, which is good too. Um, you can just play this as like a sorcery speed spell on your turn. Um, that's awesome, but if you really need it, um, which is kind of what we're going to use it more often, uh, your opponent declares an attack, you declare a blocker, you then play this to reduce the accuracy of the thing that you're going to fight and do a little bit of damage to it. Now you're more likely to kill it with the crack back attack, and they're much more likely to miss. Our first big removal spell in the deck um, again, another card that I think most decks are going to run two or three of. It's called Eruption. Deals five magma damage to a target unit and or site. If it is a site, deal an additional two magma damage to each garrisoned unit. Now, sites are a card type we don't really talk about in this deck, but it's basically something that it's like a unit that can't block, but you can attach units to it like equipment to kind of beef its stats up. Um, you can basically use this to burn out a bunch of guys in that spot. It is magma damage, so if it's, you're trying to use it against a magma creature, it won't do anything. But there aren't a ton of those, and this is just three damage, three costs for five damage. Uh, pretty much guaranteed. A huge, huge amount of damage. Then, because again, we are a hand-controlled deck, we've got three copies of Mind Shock. Target God discards two cards from their hand. This card cannot be prevented by spell resistance. Super strong. Uh, it's. I mean, it goes without saying. Your opponent's god can't try to get out of this one. They're just. You're gonna pay three, they pitch two. Really good card. Now, to go with this really good card, we have two copies of this card called a Ripple Effect. Now, this card is after a target incantation, which is all of these spells. After an incantation is resolved, Ripple Effect duplicates the spell and allows you to cast that same incantation at no cost unless the spell specifically requires it. So you pay three and duplicate any spell that's just been played. You can use this on your opponent's cards when they play a spell against you. You can pay three to duplicate it and kick it back at them. Or, a fun thing to do, pay three and make them discard two. Pay three and make them discard two. So you essentially kind of get five copies of uh, this discard two spell. Really, really strong. But the reason we're running two of this, it is a manifestation of anarchy. Now, as we kind of mentioned at the beginning of the video here, Lyle is a corruption god, so this doesn't mean anything negative to him yet, but if we're playing against an anarchy god, which there are plenty of, um, luckily there aren't a ton of them yet, fingers crossed, that have proven to be truly meta-defining that I've found, so we're a little bit safe, but if they were an anarchy god, uh, you couldn't play this card against them, so this card would just be kind of dead in your hand. Uh, that never feels good, so I run it at two instead of three, just to be a little bit more safe. Um, a little less likely to end up with three dead cards. But I think the risk is worth it. Speaking of risks that are worth it, um, one copy of Cataclysmic Strike. This is a manifestation of corruption. Now, we are a corruption god, so that's perfectly fine. Um, if your opponent is a Corruption God, normally you couldn't play this, unless, of course, you are also Corruption, then you're fine. So I am Corruption, so this means nothing to me. But uh, I think this card, pay six, deal three damage to all units and sites, um, is worth a one of in every single deck. Even if your God can't, even if like you might be able to not play it against a certain Corruption God, so what, it's one dead card. But I think the power of a very likely board wipe for six um, is really, really strong, and I think every deck should have a copy of this. I could see you 
trying to make an argument of I never want to have a card that could be a dead card, but I disagree with that in this case. Um, it's the only board wipe card in the game, and as, as we talked about earlier, three life is really, really common. One life is very common, two and three are very, very common. Um, being able to kill everything in play, really, really powerful. It does hit your own cards too, but in a control setting where we're trying to keep our opponent's hand low and their board free, um, sometimes it's worth that. And there's also a lot of times where we won't have anything yet to play. Or maybe we just have a couple of little weenies out. We can burn this for six and then play our own guy afterward. Then two copies of the Speak the Word of Death. Now this is an incantation retort, so it's an instant like we kind of talked about. This is a manifestation of darkness. Now there isn't any like darkness god yet to worry about, so... Um, again, this is a card that every deck should have two or maybe even three of if you can afford it, but nine cost is kind of spendy. But target unit is destroyed. This spell cannot be prevented or negated in any way. It doesn't affect gods or avatars. So obviously you can't just like kill your opponent's god and just like end the game. I mean, you can't kill their avatars either, but any of their regular creatures you can just kill. Even if they've got spell resistance, even if they've got ten health or something through a bunch of upgrades, they're just dead. Um, really, 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 really powerful card. And another fun little thing we can do with this. We can pay 9 to kill anything. Pay 3 to do it again. Huge, huge, huge tempo. Um, another fun thing, if your opponent tries to play one of these against you, you can't prevent it or negate it, but you can duplicate it and use it against one of your opponent's creatures as well. And the final card in our deck is called Lich Gate. This is a 10 cost spell. It's a manifestation of the gods, so every god can shuffle this card back into their deck if it gets discarded. It's a ritual. There are some cards that can discard rituals um, called Disjunction, but um, if they play it, that just that's fine. Let's just shuffle back into your deck. But while it's out, it opens a portal to the elemental planes, releasing the dead back into the realm of the living. At the beginning of each of your turns, choose a unit from your past deck, discard pile, place it onto the battlefield. If you pay its deployment cost, that unit becomes undead and gets the elemental trait of your choice. If this, if that unit is destroyed, it's then removed from the game so you can't keep looping it. But that means a lot of things. One, we could take like our really weenie little guys and chump block with them, and then next turn pay two to play it again. That's strong. Um, we can also play our five cost cards. Now, uh, even six cost units. However, the one thing that it does say is that it's the start of your turn. So the highest cost unit you can ever play is a six cost card. Now, one thing to consider with that though, is while you, while you have Rotterham Ranch, all of your units cost one less to deploy. So you can take any six or seven cost, you can take seven cost guys, these ones, and to play them for six from your discard pile. Make your opponent discard another card. That's awesome. Um, these guys die a lot, as you saw from their stats. They are very weak. Their point is really just to make your opponent discard cards. So uh, just being able to buy them back is good. This stays on the table, never goes away, unless it gets removed. Then it's shuffled in your deck and you can play it again later. Really powerful card. But that's it for the Lyle deck. Um, this is the first uh, constructed deck that I have posted here. I have a ton more decks that I've built and run through, but this one has proven to be really strong and has proven to be one of the most fun, uh, one of the least fun to play against, but um, I always really like the puzzle of a hand destruction deck of lining up the right opportunities to make your opponent discard cards to really control the flow of the game. And Lyle, the Lord of Lies, really lets you do that. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. I will probably make more of these um, and try to get back to doing videos a little more regularly. Anyway, until next time.